Welcome in. In this video, we are going to be looking at how accurate this is, how composers modulate. What I'm going to do is go through each composer, tell you whether or not I agree, then also give you a musical example from them so that hopefully you'll learn a thing or two about modulation in this video, but also be able to make sense of this beautiful graph here. And before we jump in with our first composer, I have to share something with you pretty important and personal and fairly embarrassing. I printed a meme. I didn't want to, I, I did it for you so that I could look at this instead of like looking off to the side of my computer or phone the whole video. But yeah, I printed a meme. So it's, it's pretty much it for me. We're gonna start off here right at the top with J.S. Bach. And what it says about Bach is that he likes to be in an old key, circle of fifths, new key. And I, I absolutely love this one. I think it is so, so accurate, which by the way, brings up a good point. I'm not saying that this is Bach's most juiced form of modulation. If we went with the what type of modulation to do the most, basically all composers would be uh, direct modulation or pivot chord, but that wouldn't be as interesting, right? So we're trying to get at what is their hallmark? What are they kind of known for? And this is so, so, so accurate. What a circle of fifth sequence is, is the progression of chords whose roots are all a fifth apart. And the feature of it is that every other chord is a step higher or step lower. So for example, if we do C, G, D, E, B, F, or they could go down. You could go C, F, B, E, A, D, G. So every other chord can move up a step or every other chord could move down a step. So what Bach does with this is just what the graphic shows. He's in a key. He hits a circle of fifth sequence, progressively moving up a step or down a step, and this sequence only ends when he gets to his goal key. So what we're going to do is check out Prelude in C sharp minor. This is the fourth prelude from the first book of the Well Tempered Clavier. In a measure five, there's this chord sequence down here where you get this. Like I said, Bach and jazz both like this chord progression. It could kind of be jazzy, right, with the right. What the melody is going to do here is repeat itself a step lower every measure, like this. Start over. So what Bach is going to do here at measure five is try to get to the key of E major, but he doesn't start there. So he starts his progression out, and he's just going to continue letting this roll off until we get to the key of E, like this. Are we in the key of E? Nope, not yet. Just move it down. Nope, not there yet. And then we made it. Up next here we have Beethoven, and Beethoven's graphic says old key, 5151-5151, new key, something like this. I want to go to a new key. Now while that's pretty funny and also definitely a stereotype of Beethoven, like he loves going 5151-5151, I don't know if it's the most accurate on the list here, but honestly, Beethoven is one of the most difficult ones to pin down because it uses so many types of modulations all the time. But I want to kind of bring out what I consider to be maybe a little more of a hallmark of Beethoven. Beethoven loves direct modulations and also pivot chord modulations and also something called kind of hammering your way to chord modulation where you play a chord. And you just sort of change one note chromatically at a time till you get to the new chord. But let's just take a second and focus on direct modulation because you see direct modulation all over in Beethoven. And if you don't know what it is, direct modulation is just what it sounds like. You're in a key and you just get transported to a new key. So check out Sonata number 21 in C major, Waldstein Sonata. Here's the first five measures. We start out with the C chord, which is good. We're in the key of C. Then he does a D chord to a G chord. It's like, oh, we're, we're really in the key of G made because it's in the key of G. And then Beethoven just goes B flat, 
which is really, really funny, right? We've had three chords in the entire piece. We started out on C. D, G, and then B flat. And then funny enough, a little bit later, he does the same thing again, C chord. D chord again, G chord. Then he's like, last time we just went directly to, to B flat, now we're just gonna go right to a D minor chord. I wrote down so many more examples of Beethoven on this chart here, but I'm so afraid the video is gonna be like 50 minutes long if I go through every single one. So let's move on. Let's look at Chopin next. This one says, old key, something chromatic, new key. I love this one as well. This one is so, so, so good. And I would say they really, really nailed, like this is kind of the hallmark Chopin thing. Again, again, if we're going for most common, it's probably pivot chord, but we're talking about what's the like unique thing that's special to them. What's their thing. There could be kind of two interpretations of this. One could be when the melody becomes really chromatic in Chopin, you get like, you know, and you can't really distinguish what, what key you're in, it's easy to switch keys in that. But I think I, I view this more from like a chord point of view and just to kind of fill out a little more details, Chopin loves to do fully diminished seven chords like this, fully diminished seventh chords. There's only three of them. We're not gonna get into all the details in this video, but they're extremely harsh chords to our ears when you first hear them. And they almost always resolve like this. Or, or, they almost always go to a major or minor chord, which Chopin likes to do, which seems to just break all the rules of music, is take a fully diminished seventh chord and just move it down a half step, and then do it again, then again, then again. Sort of like the Bach, you just continue until you land on your goal. That's kind of what he's doing by just taking a fully diminished seventh chord and walking it down by half step. Here is a ridiculous example from the third Chopin etude, which is, by the way, really beautiful. But this is on the third page. Things go absolutely chaotic and pianists everywhere just memorize every single note because making sense of the chord is really difficult here. But I'm gonna actually help you make a little sense of the chords. And for some reason, you're up for playing some advanced Chopin. So it starts out with this, which is actually just one fully diminished seventh chord. Then he just slides it down to a different one. Cool. And then he does a whole bunch in a row. I missed a few notes in there because I'm trying to look at the camera and not my fingers, but you hear what I mean. But if you were to take all those notes and smush them down into one octave, you get something like this. Fully diminished seventh chord, move it down. Move it down quicker. Move it down. Move it down quicker. Just kind of insane stuff, but it works. Then when he gets to this destination, he just kind of he just kind of stops there. On to Schubert. Schubert is a brilliant addition to this list because he's a lot less famous than the other people on the list, but he's kind of has a pretty well-known modulation style. So it makes a lot of sense to include him on here because you do kind of study how Schubert does key changes. So Schubert just says, old key. <laughs> Just kidding. You can kind of imagine him. Like, I like how it's the only thing with color on the whole page. It's kind of like Schubert just kind of gets out his red pen and goes, forget about that. New key. And what's sort of implied here is the idea of direct modulation, which I've already told you, Beethoven's kind of like a direct modulation guy. But we're going to get a little bit into the details of how Schubert does it. Now, there are a lot of different ways you can think about Schubert modulations. In fact, every few years, I feel like I hear a new person explain Schubert modulations using a new analogy, maybe in a new way, but I wanna just keep it really, really simple here. Schubert likes to modulate directly in new keys, often by keeping at least one note in common with the old key. So an example I want to give for you is going from C to E flat. That is a minor third higher. It seems like a difficult key to get to. If you're like, you know, playing on stage and you're in the key of C and the singer's like, hey, go to the key of E flat. That might make some of you panic, especially if you're not like big improv musicians. You're like, well, I'm in C. Do I need to do like, you know, circle of fifths? I get to E flat. It's going to take you a while, right? Um, what Schubert does is says, can I find a common tone between C and E flat? And in fact, G is a common tone between the C chord and the E flat chord, well, he's done. Why, why, why do anything else? You can play a C chord with a G. Now you're in the key of E flat. See how simple that was? So what he does, again, it finds a common tone. Like, let's do another one. Let's say we went to the key of C. We're going to the key of A flat. 
What's key is C. Hang out on the C here. A flat also has a C. Let's go to the key of E. See how, see how I'm just kind of sliding in and out of keys because you just kind of keep one note the same and then shift the chord underneath that. Now, the example I have for you, Schubert does just that. This is his third piano impromptu, which starts something like this. But the example I have is about measure nine here. I'm gonna play just the chords. I want you to listen to is how on top here, I'm gonna to get to this note right here. I wanna get stuck on that note in the melody, but the chord underneath it, the chord is going to shift. So here we go, this part goes. Pretty cool, right? So we kinda of got to this chord here. Shift it. Okay, now a little more context. Shift the chord. Then the real piece actually has filled in chords, something kind of like. Now last and definitely least, we have Mozart. It's a joke, okay? It's, it's just a joke. And Mozart's graphic says old key, pivot chord, new key. And this is definitely a reference to Mozart being kind of like our quintessential classical composer, the stereotype of him just kind of doing things in the most uh, traditional way possible. It's a stereotype, it's not not completely true, but, but the pivot chord modulation is like one of the first things you learn in college. It's thought of as like the most basic one. And like I said, almost all the composers on the list Maybe direct modulation and pivot chord modulation. Probably pivot chord modulation is the most popular one, right? So they kind of gave it to Mozart. But you know, it's it's not the worst. As I start to think about Mozart's pieces, I'm like, there are just a lot of pivot chord modulations. He might have kind of two hallmarks. One would be direct modulations to minor keys or major back and forth, like section to section. And then, yeah, a lot of pivot chords. For those of you who don't know, the idea of a pivot chord is really simple. You find a chord that exists in both the old key and the new key. So for example, if we're in C major and we want to go to G major, a chord that exists in the same form in both of those keys is A minor. C, C major, it's the sixth chord, it's A minor. And G major, the second chord is A minor. So I guess the best way to think about pivot chords is up until the pivot chord, everything makes sense in the old key. From the pivot chord onward, everything makes sense in the new key. So for example, you're in the key of C. There's A minor, but now we're gonna pretend like we've been in the key of G the whole time. So we're gonna do like A minor. Like we're in the key of G now. So A minor, D, G. So everything makes sense up to the pivot chord. Pivot chord but we're gonna pretend like we're in the key of G now. If you have a different opinion from me on Mozart, like you feel like he really does kind of have a go-to way of modulating that's more unique than the pivot chord, feel free to let me know in the comments down below. For, for sure, give me some examples because I kind of struggle the most with Mozart thinking of, again, I direct modulation and pivot chord. It might just be the best way to kind of define his modulation styles, but maybe if you're like a singer or if you are an instrumentalist in an orchestra, you've seen different variety of Mozart music than I've seen a lot, for sure, let me know what those are down in the comments. Before you go, I just wanna ask that you share this video with a few of your friends and maybe together we can make this video half as popular as this meme has been because us musicians have just been loving this thing. It's so funny, so cute. Again, I did not put this together. Credit where credit is due. This is really, really, really well done. Really love it. See you guys in the next video.